Well, uh, good morning again. And if you have forgotten already, my name is Hayden. <laughs> Surely you wouldn't forget that. Well, um, I want to tell you something about myself this morning, uh, which you may not know, uh, but for some probably won't be too surprising. Uh, and that is this, that I'm the kind of guy who likes to read small print, terms of conditions, terms of services, the back of DVD covers, all those little writings. I like reading them, instructions. I read it all. My wife, Elisa, discovered this when we uh, moved into our first apartment. Uh, my dad came over and he quickly found the owner's manual to our apartment and found the instructions for our dishwasher. And I was not far behind him. Uh, my sister is the same, and if you can believe it, my four-year-old son is the same. He is regularly reading Lego instructions or going back to instructions for his toys and all sorts of various different things. I don't know what it is or why we're like it, but I do know the reactions of the faces I get when p people find this out about me. Um, and frankly, I do not care. You can live your hippie, dippy, free-flowing life without knowing the instructions of how to recover your microwave from being lock safety locked. But you'll all come running to me when it does, and I'll be there because it's harder than you realize. I like reading small print. Um, to be honest, in my experience with uh, different nonprofits and writing policies and all sorts of things like that, I would say many people find constitutions church constitutions would be in a similar category to small print, like the terms and agreement that you do when you're installing software on a PC. Uh, someone should really read that stuff, so we, whether we know it's bad or not, right? Uh, this morning, I'm not going to try to convince you of the importance of constitutions or terms and agreement, all that kind of stuff like that. But I, I want to highlight two words for you from our constitution. Uh, from a thing which seems like dry legalese, uh, from our mission statement. And that is this, glorifying God, making disciples. And this, this morning in particular, I want to look at the glorifying God part of our mission statement. Uh, because I've noticed a couple of things over the years. Uh, one, we, we don't really have a good understanding too much of what it means to glorify God. I mean, the word glorify is not really well used much anymore in, in normal kind of language, except for in spiritual circles. And most people I've kind of asked about the question of what glorifying God means, have kind of, they've wanted further clarification or they feel like they don't know it well enough as they should, right? Uh, and secondly, the more I actually look into Scripture, the more I see uh, this term and concept, it's everywhere in the Bible. And I think it influences more than we probably realize as we look at our lives and, and, and do ministry. And it seems to also be a huge part of what it means to live life as it is supposed to be lived. So, which I, I know is a pretty big call. But I think this morning, as we kind of go through, you'll agree with me. So let's have a better look at the topic of glorifying God and, and get an understanding together this morning of the thing we have agreed to as a church should be a part of our daily lives, glorifying God. So what does it mean? Uh, in Paul in uh, Corinthians 10, 31 says this, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Moses famously in chapter 33 of Exodus says this to God, please show me your glory. The psalmist in 104, uh, Psalm 104 verse 31 says this, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. In Ezekiel 36 verse 22, God says this, he says, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. And finally, in Revelation chapter 21, speaking of the new heavens and new earth, we'll all enter into one day as believers. It says this about that new heavens and new earth. It says, and the city has no need of a sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the Lamb. According to these verses, we should live for God's glory. We could ask for it to be seen. God acts according to His glory and for His glory to be made known. And it can be like a light to us and can stand the test of time. So what does glorifying God mean? Well, let's start with the word glory. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, glory is a great admiration or honor or praise that you kind of 
earn by doing something successfully or it's something of great beauty or extremely beautiful or special that gives pleasure, right? Biblically, we would say this. God's glory is the manifest sum of His perfect divine being. For years, Christians have been talking about the different attributes or traits or characteristics of God as it helps us to kind of understand what He's like and and who He is. You might have heard of words like omnipotent or omniscient or omnipresent or holy or eternal or love and all these different things to describe God. The list goes on and it's definitely not limited to those. And God is perfectly and fully all of these things. And His glory is the sum of those things revealed to us. God's glory is the sum of who He is revealed to us. Think for a, for a moment what this means. Look at this list of God's attributes on the screen here that I've put up there, traits of God. Not only do we have a God who is omnipotent, as in all-powerful, or omniscient, as in all-knowing, but He's also omnipresent, as in He's outside the limits of space. He is a satiety, which is a fancy word for saying He is self-sufficient, As in, when God created everything, He didn't need us. He just created it because He wanted to. He is eternal, outside our understanding of time. He is good, as in every word and deed He does is excellent and is the definition of good and the standard of excellent and good. He is just. Everything that God does is right and always is right. And He sets the standard of it being right. And He is holy. He is separated from sin. It is not a part of Him whatsoever. And He does things according to His plans and His ideas. He works according to His own compass. That is our God, and not only is that our God, but He chooses to reveal this, His glory to us, like a blazing light of beauty. This is what we mean by God's glory. And it's an amazing vision. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, every second Sunshine Coast person I've spoken to has complained by the lack of sunshine. Uh, the, the name of our region is really quite descriptive of our people, isn't it? Uh, but what I find interesting, as I read earlier, is that in the new heavens and in the new earth, there is no sun. Because as it says, for the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the Lamb. Isn't that so telling of the intensity and the beauty and the mind-bogglingness of God's glory? If it's compared to the sun, the the thing we love that we can't look at because it's so overwhelming, God's glory is the manifest sum of His perfect divine being that He chooses to reveal to us. And so to glorify God then means that as people, we highlight that greatness of His glory to the world around us, to show the world around us just how good God really is in everything we do and act. You want to know a good example of someone glorifying someone else? State of origin. People get dressed up in stadiums, in pubs, in homes, in the streets. They're all wearing the colors of the state to glorify the wonderful state of Queensland. And a couple people mistakenly, because they haven't seen the light yet, are glorifying the state of New South Wales. You can always tell who a footy fan is, yeah? They speak about it. They wear it on their clothes and they spend their money on it. And you can see the joy of the game in their eyes, yeah? Glorifying God is showing His greatness to a watching world through our words and deeds. And how fitting is it for us to do that? After all, if God is truly like that list of attributes, surely He would be worthy of being credited with every good thing for being shown as as being amazing, to be highlighted as the reason for anything we have. In fact, I would make the call that we, that, that this was how we actually were designed as humans. I'd argue that humans can't help but glorify something. I'll show you what I mean. In Genesis 1, we, some, we discover something pretty startling from the Genesis account. In verse 27, it says this, about God creating the world, he says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created man and woman in his image. 
In my house, we try to take lots of photos. In fact, I got a better phone just so I could take better photos of my kids. Shamelessly, here's a picture of one of them. Isn't he cute? I know. <laughs> Made him myself with my wife. Um, now, when I take photos of my kids, uh, I don't take an image of them to highlight the ability that I can take a photo, right? I take a photo to highlight something about my child, their smile, the food on their face, their beauty. I take a photo to reveal something about them to myself and for other people around them to see. In the same way, God created us in his image to reveal something of himself to the world around us. We are like him in some ways, and not always, but definitely in some ways. And so by nature, we are created to, as images of God, to reflect him, to reveal what he is like, to glorify him. Man was made to glorify God because man was made in the image of God. So we can't help but glorify something. This fits nicely with another biblical concept, and that is this, that humans cannot help but love. We were made in God's image, and something that's true about God and something true about us is that we are both lovers. Philosopher James K.A. Smith describes humans as a, a people orientated towards a vision of flourishing, that we can't help but be on a quest for how things should be. We crave it. We work towards it. It's a natural, innate part of us because we're satisfied when we get it. And so naturally, the way we operate in this world is based upon our desires, our love, our cravings. We want, we crave, we love. Humans cannot help but love. St. Augustine, the, the early church theologian, knew this, but he saw this in connection about to God. And he, he said this quote, which you may know. Uh, he said this quote about God. He said this, You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Humans were created for loving God, for relationship with Him. And we earn for this ultimate way of how things should be from the, the bottom of our beings. We are lovers made to love. And what is interesting about lovers is that they glorify the one they love, don't they? Uh, I've been around some engaged couples recently, and there's something you notice about engaged couples is that they desire to show their love to the other person in the relationship. They're infatuated. They enjoy each other so much that they're willing to go through the whole stressful process of getting married and doing the wedding and getting to the day and standing in front of all these witnesses to declare that love. Now, as witnesses, we may at times go, oh, that's a bit much. But I think we feel uneasy because what's really going on here is that person is showing how great the other person is, aren't they? They're glorifying them. They're showing their greatness. Because when we love, we can't help but show the world how great the thing is that we love. We glorify it. We were made to love, and so we glorify what we love. We were made to love God, and so we glorify God. Now, understanding the idea of glorifying God this way helps me quite a bit, because I don't like the idea of someone telling me that I was made to glorify them. And that makes that person seem a little bit self-centered, doesn't it? But if glorifying is the natural expression of love, and God is as really great as we've seen, it becomes natural thing to glorify God. Because God is surely the greatest and therefore most lovable, for the sake of lack of a better word, thing, being in the universe, I should say, not thing, being. And so we should be able to glorify Him. And I hope that brings some clarity of what it means to glorify God. But there is a problem, though, isn't there? We don't glorify God as we should, do we? We're a distracted bunch, us humans. Written in our fundamental humanness is a relationship with God and glorifying Him in it. But instead of living that out, we choose, to, we, well, we choose a path to glorify other things. We make other things gods in our lives. Adam and Eve, the first created humans, made in the image of God to be in relationship with Him, to glorify Him. Rather than listening to God, they chose to listen to someone else. And to do something, as we see in verse 5 of chapter 3, to help them become like God themselves. 
seeking their own independence from God, not trusting God for what He said, failing to give honor due to God that He deserves. Now, we know from our list of attributes earlier that God is good, isn't He? He's trustworthy, surely, but they failed to do this. They love the idea of themselves being God instead. And Paul writes the results of, of what happened uh, and, and the rest of us as their children in, in Romans 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. It says this, For although they knew God, describing humanity, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. On that day, mankind put its love elsewhere. Adam and Eve put their love elsewhere and as such didn't glorify God as they should have and didn't love God as they should have and the consequences ensued so that we all became naturally lovers disconnected from the God that we were made to love, glorifying created things rather than God himself. Can you see how bad that is? You see, the best thing that God could ever do for someone is give himself in relationship. After all, we saw that list of attributes. God is a definition of good, of power, of holiness, of love. He is love. He is trustworthy. There is nothing in this universe outside of space or time or anything like that better than God. And He chose to create us, not based upon our, our works or our foreseen amazingness, to be in relationship with Him, to know Him, to know His glory, and to not only know it, but to enjoy it. Can you see how devastating it would be to be a person who does not have that kind of relationship? It would mean everything else they found in life would be fundamentally subpar. It might look nice to begin with, but it would eventually fade, fail, and draw attention to its imperfections. The preacher of Ecclesiastes saw this about life and says this, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? It's pointless without God. By choosing not to glorify God, mankind has missed out on the type of life that God had gifted mankind with, a life of an enjoyment in knowing and in loving God and enjoying Him. And not only that, as we have seen, that God is just. And so mankind is also liable for punishment as well. After all, Adam and Eve chose to defy the king of kings, dishonor what is perfect, not love as they should, the one who is the very definition of love, treasonously declaring themselves as God instead of God. News headlines last week was about a man who dressed up as an older woman, broke, got into the Louvre and tried to smear cake on the Mona Lisa painting. It's pretty bizarre. The painting's fine. There was a glass casing around it, all as well. But it was still very strange. And the whole world was really shocked that someone would do something to do such a timeless piece of art. How much more should we be shocked when Adam and Eve gave the middle finger to the perfect king of king and said they will do things their own way? So how do we come back from this? The consequences of Adam and Eve has, has spread through all of humanity. By default, we're all missing out on life as it should be lived and are facing punishment as well for doing the same thing our ancestors have done, failing to glorify God, going our own ways, chasing and loving other things. How do we come back from not living out our purposes of glorifying God? In John 17, verses 4 to 5, Jesus prayed the most remarkable thing. I glorified you on earth, he said having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is what he prayed to his Father. You see, Jesus was different than anyone else who came before him and anyone else since. While he was definitely fully God, he was also fully man and was tempted with the same things we get tempted with. But instead of making other things gods and glorifying them, at the end of his life, he was able to declare that he fully glorified God. He did, not, he did something that no one else could do. 
But that's not all. Interestingly, he also claimed that he has been part of a relationship within the Godhead, the, the Trinity, where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have glorified each other by perfectly loving each other for all eternity. If there was anyone who knows how to glorify God, it is surely Jesus. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. That is Jesus, the radiance of the glory of God. What's also interesting about Jesus is that when He asks God the Father to glorify Him here in verse 5 of John 17, to show His greatness... When he's asking him to glorify the Son, he's talking about his own death on a cross and subsequent resurrection and ascension. You see, God's glory, as we've already seen, is wrapped up with humans benefiting from it. Particularly, his glory is seen in his life and death and resurrection and the ascension of the Son. The glorious Jesus sent by the Father down to the earth to live the perfect life on mankind's behalf, to make up for the perfect life they could never live, and died the death that we deserved for the crimes we committed against God. And by doing both of these things, Jesus, by doing both of these things perfectly, He actually gained the rewards of perfectly glorifying God for Himself, life as it was supposed to be lived and saved us from having to face the punishment we deserved. And also by rising again and ascending to heaven, He now shares those rewards of us who are believers, the benefits of that life as it's supposed to be lived, that eternal life with those who have placed their faith in Him. And continues now in front, on the throne, praising and glorifying God as He always has, but now also on His people's behalf too. So how do we come back from not glorifying God, for not living out our purposes of glorifying God? Through Jesus. Through, living the, through Him living the perfect life of glorifying God on our behalf. Through Him taking the punishment we deserve by not glorifying God. And by Him glorifying God on, on our behalf in heaven too. And sending the Spirit to change us, to be more like this Jesus. We can glorify God through Jesus. So what does this all mean for us as a church? If our mission is to glorify God, what does this mean for, our, for us? I think all this means three things. Number one is this. We should worship God. As I highlighted earlier, one of the main ways we can glorify God is by loving Him. Because in our pursuit of love, we bring glory to the thing that is loved. And so we should express our love to God by worshipping Him and therefore glorifying Him. It makes sense. And that's why every Sunday when you come here, we have a spot to worship and praise and glorify Him. That's why we have songs that are about how great God is. There's even one which literally says that over and over and over again. We praise Him. We glorify Him for who He is and what He has done. But all this worshipping really does rely on us loving God well, doesn't it? And we all know how dull that can be at times. So part of us worshipping well means that we probably need to take the effort to stir up our love for God too. And I'm going to give you two suggestions to help with that, to, to help stir up your love for God. The first one is this, rest in God's acceptance of Jesus' perfect worship on our behalf. We need to remember as Christians, Jesus has perfectly glorified and worshipped God on our behalf and is worshipping God right now on our behalf, as we see in the book of Hebrews, as He's our high priest in heaven. We need to rest in the freedom of that, knowing you can begin and fumble imperfectly in your journey of worship, knowing that you'll be loved and helped by Jesus on the way. If we realize this, we'll, we'll feel a bit more confident to come to worship, yeah? But we'll also, that does stir up a love for Him, that He'll even take my imperfect worship, yeah? And help us to worship Him more. We need to remember that. We need to rest in Jesus' acceptance of our perfect worship. Uh, of, we need to rest in God's acceptance of Jesus' perfect worship on our behalf. And number two, we need to get a clearer picture of who God is. 
if we get a clearer, clearer picture of who God is, that's going to help us to love Him better. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul states this. He says, We all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. A part of our Christian growth process is seeing Jesus as He should be seen. Seeing Him as His glorious self and enjoying Him in that. How are you seeing God? Do you enjoy Him? Is He seen as the best gift that you could get? If He's not, then perhaps you need to work on some habits. As I said earlier, it is in the gospel of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that we see the glory of God so perfectly. How often are you recalling your place in the gospel story? How often are you recalling the gospel? How often are you reading your scriptures to allow you to point back to Jesus and what He did through the gospel? And how often do you come to church? The church is meant to be a place where people, where as a people, we kind of point back to God. We point back to Jesus so that we can get a clearer picture of who He is. How's your habit of going to church this year? We live in a world full of competing stories competing pictures, trying to take God's rightful spot. And our habits, habits can help, you know, rob God of His rightful spot. We need to stir up our love for God by getting into some good habits to get a clearer picture of Him so that we can love Him better. And in doing so, we will worship God better and thus glorify Him better. We as a church should worship God Number two thing as a church, what we should do, we should love each other to the glory of God. As we saw earlier, humans are benefited by the pursuit of God's glory. Jesus being glorified literally meant our salvation. And so we should love one another to the glory of God. Now, Rodney spoke about church membership a couple of weeks ago, so I won't repeat any of that here. But if there's anything that church membership highlights to us, is that God's people aren't meant to be a bunch of people who come and watch a show at church. No, we're meant to be involved. We're meant to help. We're meant to encourage, to fellowship to enjoy one another, to love one another, to serve one another. As it says in Hebrews 10, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We should love one another to the glory of God, because glorifying God involves loving others. And thirdly, we should evangelize to the glory of God. God being glorified meant the salvation of others. And we should continue that mission. In fact, we aren't alone in that process. Habakkuk 2, verse 14 says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and the, as the waters cover the sea. That's what he spoke about, a future reality. God has been at work to reveal His glorious self across the world. He's been at work for His people to, for people to love Him and therefore live the life they're supposed to live. God's been at work to glorify Himself in the earth. And so part of glorifying God means joining Him on that mission, going out with Him, scattering ourselves across the various parts of the Sunshine Coast and across the world to spread this good news about Jesus, who is a radiance of the glory of God. And that's also why we say glorify God and make disciples. It's all connected. Glorifying God is not just some small print or instructions or little things we might forget. Or it's definitely not some dry legalese to read, be read in some dusty competition, uh, constitution. Rather, in fact, it breathes life into our church. It compels us and gives us a reason to worship God, to love one another, and go out and spread the gospel, which is interestingly an upward and inward and outward purpose, which if you remember long ago was quite prominent in our church constitution and still is our purpose. So, 
how are you going at glorifying God? Because we should and can glorify God with Jesus. Let's uh, move on to the next song and we'll um, continue to worship God. I'll pray as these guys come up, hey? (laughs) Father, we just thank you so much that you are good. You're the definition of good. That we can praise you because you are good. (laughs) Lord, help us to see that in our own lives. Help us to get a clear picture for you. Stir up our love for you. We thank you that you're doing that in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.